Thank you, Nance, for the sweet introduction. Thank you to all of you for sticking around. Uh, it's been a pretty amazing day, and uh, um, so thanks for being here. When I was younger, personal conversations with my friends tended to revolve around our personal aspirations and dreams, what schools we were going to apply to, what kinds of jobs we were hoping to get. Now that we're all a little older, they tend to revolve around the welfare of our aging parents. One of my friends has a mother who lives in India. Lately, she started losing weight. She was complaining about poor sleep, and she was losing interest in things that she used to enjoy. This pretty much sums up many of the symptoms of major depression. And as a matter of fact, when she was placed on antidepressants, her condition improved. But you know what? She did not consider her illness to be emotional in nature. She thought of it as a physical thing. The emotional part, it was there, but it didn't occur to her to connect it to her condition. She didn't connect the dots. And here's the thing. Perhaps she's right. Perhaps major depression is not primarily an emotional disorder. Now, that kind of statement is quite a departure from the status quo. Because for the last 60 years, we have worked on the assumption that it is an emotional disorder, one that is tied to the brain. And in the process, we have made some progress. We discovered that major depression is associated with imbalances in neurotransmitters. We've identified brain regions that are associated with depression and the structural changes that um, go with it. And we developed medications intended to address these symptoms. Do they work? Well, that depends how you want to define success. There's no question that antidepressants are very popular. We consume a ton of medication. The Centers for Disease Control reported that in the period between 2005 and 2008, one in 10 individuals over the age of 12 was on antidepressants. That number is likely to be higher today. And in fact, in severe cases of depression, these drugs do provide relief. But critics have argued that for less severe cases of depression, these antidepressants are barely better than sugar pills. And regardless, they do not cure depression. Once you've had your first episode of major depression, there's a 50% chance that you will have another. If you do, there's an 80% chance you're going to have a third. So why is that? It's because we do not understand the underlying mechanisms that lead to these imbalances in neurotransmitters, that lead to these structural changes. And so we're stumbling in the dark. In clinical practice, we rely on trial and error. If you go to the doctor's office, you would get a prescription. And if it works, great. No questions asked, everybody's happy. If it doesn't work, what happens? You up the dose, you switch medications. And you keep doing that until you find something that works eventually. So that is the state of the art after 60 years of research. Oy. So I'm suggesting a different approach. I'm suggesting to reconceptualize major depression as some form of infectious disease. Now you may go, what? But consider what is self-evident to my friend's mother. Patients who are depressed act as if they're sick. Uh, they are lethargic, they lose appetite, 
they lose interest, they may have a tough time even getting out of bed. And it turns out that depression is indeed associated with biomarkers of inflammation, a signal of some kind of illness. And so researchers have begun to consider the possibility that inflammation may indeed cause or significantly contribute to depression. But then I have to ask, what is the cause of the inflammation in the first place? It could be the activation of an immune response to an infection, which could come from parasites, bacteria, or viruses. Now, is there any evidence at all in nature that such microorganisms could change and alter their host's behavior? Absolutely. And I will give you a couple of examples as illustrations. I don't mean to imply that the illustrations I'll give you are the cause of depression, but they illustrate some of the mechanisms that Mother Nature has already figured out by which uh, the infected host's life and behavior can be altered. And then I will take this new way of looking at depression and explain to you how it informs and changes our way of thinking about the genetics of depression, which also has kind of run into a wall. And then I will close with what I hope will be a call to arms. So let me start with parasites. Let me start with the example, the story of the suicidal cricket. When a cricket becomes infected with a Gordian worm, that worm grows inside of it until it reaches sexual maturity. The problem for the worm is it can only mate in water, and the cricket isn't a water creature. So, what do you think happens? The cricket has its brain hijacked by the worm, alters its behavior, seeks out water, and jumps into it. In the process, the cricket drowns, and the worm emerges from the vessel it was in, looking to get laid. <laughs> now, researchers have begun to look into the biochemistry of this remarkable behavioral phenomenon. And what they discovered is amazing. They discovered that the worm dispenses proteins into the cricket's head, and when they looked at the nature of these proteins, they realized these are proteins that are already understood to affect neurotransmission and brain development. Let me give you another example. This is the example of um, Toxoplasma gondii, or Toxo for short. Toxo only mates inside the intestines of cats. And then it releases its eggs, and the eggs are excreted through feline feces into the environment. But Toxo now has a problem. How does the next generation of its, you know, how does its offspring make it into another cat? Right? It wants its offspring to get into another cat so it can grow happily ever after and mate again. It always comes back to sex, doesn't it? So, what does it do? Well, it figured out an ingenious method for moving its eggs into another cat. And it does so by infected rats that come into contact with the feline feces or with the, with the eggs that are around the environment. And when a rat becomes infected with toxo, it becomes sexually aroused and attracted to the scent of cat urine. Hey, I'm not judging, I'm just telling you. <laughs> okay? So how does it do that? It rewires the brain regions that are involved in fear processing and sexual arousal, and it alters the levels of neurotransmitters in the rat's brain. Now, the aroused rat, instead of finding love, strikes out big time, gets eaten, right? 
and the toxo inside the rat, well, it just found a new home. And you thought your last move was a nightmare. So humans can also become infected by toxo. And as a matter of fact, the numbers are staggering. The estimates are that one-third of the world's population and one-fifth of the U.S. population is infected with toxo. One study was an epidemiological study of 20 European nations, and what they were doing was correlating the prevalence of toxo presence with suicide rates, and they found a significant positive correlation between the two. I'm referring, obviously, to human suicides, not cricket suicides or rat suicides. All right, so let me uh, switch from parasites to bacteria as a second example. Did you know that we have more than a thousand species of bacteria living inside our guts? We actually need them because they help us process the foods we ingest. But they also seem to play a role in our emotional well-being. Researchers have begun to look at mice to do some animal studies to get at the uh, underlying mechanisms. And these were mice that were specifically uh, engineered to be uh, free of any intestinal bacteria. So we're talking germ-free mice. Wouldn't you love to have those in your dorm room, right? Now, these mice are easily stressed when subjected to psychological stressors in the lab, but their stress response can become normalized when they are treated with common intestinal bacterial strains. And there's also a number of studies in humans that have begun to look at the role of probiotics, these you know, healthy uh, bacterial colonies, and reported that uh, you know, research participants uh, reported improvement in their mood and reduction in anxious and depressive symptoms. And one brain imaging study uh, reported that over the course of a four-week diet, uh, probiotic diet, um, brain activation patterns changed significantly in these participants. So now, if bacteria can lift your mood, maybe there's others that can depress it. Or maybe, sometimes, in some people, these good bacteria could mutate and basically become emotional pathogens. And maybe there's a difference between the intestinal bacterial composition of a healthy person compared to that of a depressed person. If that were the case, then maybe transferring the bacterial content of a healthy person and transplanting it into a um, depressed person might constitute some form of therapy. So I'm talking about fecal transplants. Gross! Right? But it's actually been done, not in depressed patients, it's been done in some cases of really difficult to treat diarrhea, and there it worked really well. So, you know, next time you see a, a depressed person, they tell you how shitty they feel, you know, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> let, me turn to, um, let me turn to viruses. Viruses are the most ubiquitous life form on Earth. They have many ways to invade our bodies. They can stay dormant for a long time until they're activated by some sort of external event, perhaps a stressful life event. And they can be passed across generations. These are all things that are consistent with what we know about depression. I'll give you one example here, the Borna disease virus, or BDV. It infects farm animals and causes neurological symptoms in these animals. According to one study, it can also infect the human brain, and the likelihood of infection is greater in depressed individuals than it is in non-depressed individuals. There was one very small clinical study that found that depressed patients who happened to be infected with Borna, uh, when they were treated for the, uh, for the virus, not only experienced a uh, reduction in the biomarkers for the virus, but also reported uh, improvement in depressive symptoms. At the same time, this is a very controversial field because there's many studies um, that uh, failed to find any link between BDV and depression at all. 
but there's many other viruses to look at. And when you start thinking about the role that these microorganisms can play, you start thinking about the genetics of depression. Twin studies suggest that there should be genes that play a role in depression, but when we look for them, we have a tough time finding them. Why is that? Well, maybe we're looking at the wrong organism. Maybe we should be looking at the genomes of all of these microorganisms that we carry with us. And, you know, the work so far has looked at the human genome, but you know what? It's not all human. Our genome isn't all human. Both parasites and viruses can insert their genetic material into ours. In fact, 8% of our DNA is believed to come from these alien sources. And that BDV virus I talked about before, it was recently discovered that segments of its DNA are in ours. So maybe the genes associated with depression lurk in these genomes of all of these microorganisms we carry in us, or maybe they lurk in spaces we haven't looked at before, like these you know, foreign elements of DNA that are embedded in ours. So this is my thesis, that major depression could be a form of an infectious disease, which could be caused by parasitic, bacterial, or viral sources that could go undetected until activated by some event, that once activated has the power and the mechanisms to alter our neurotransmission and rewire our brains, and that can be passed around from generation to generation, which could be the missing genetic piece that eluded us so far. Now, I can almost see the collective worry over this crowd going, um, I have this roommate, he's been bummed out lately. Am I going to catch depression from him? <laughs> I don't think so. If that were the case, then 100% of the population would have it, and that's not the case. Right? So an infectious disease does not necessarily mean it's a contagious disease. So we can all have a communal sign of relief. <sighs> we won't catch anything that way. All right? But by reconceptualizing depression as an infectious disease, we have a new approach to think about mechanisms and genetic targets. So this is my call to arms. Let's not settle for symptom reduction. Let's commit ourselves to finding a genuine cure. Let's aspire to that. Let us do that so that hopelessness, so much a feature of depression, may give way to hope after all. And in the language of my friend's mother, Shakriya, thank you.